If you've been following SpaceX for a while, you've likely noticed that the company consistently pioneers recovery techniques for its rockets. From landing on a drone ship to catching the tower, Elon's company set itself apart from the others in the aerospace industry. For decades now, the industry has faced a persistent reality. Rockets were either partially destroyed after launch or they never came back to Earth. This represents quite the waste, especially considering humanity's ambition to explore the vast universe beyond our planet. SpaceX, however, has completely transformed this narrative. The company developed bold methods for recovering and reusing rockets, shattering traditional limits, and redefining the approach to manufacturing and launching spacecraft. The Falcon rocket series in particular has been instrumental in this process. Since SpaceX's first successful landing of the Falcon 9 rocket in December of 2015, the company has recovered approximately 376 rocket boosters and reused them in 352 launches. This achievement has not only revolutionized spaceflight, but also demonstrated unparalleled economic efficiency. Now, some may argue that NASA has also recovered spacecrafts and solid rocket boosters, refurbing and reusing them for later launches. And while that's true, it's crucial to consider both the technical and economic efficiency in comparison. The entire shuttle program cost $192 billion as of 2010, averaging $1.4 billion per mission across 134 flights. By contrast, the commercial price for a Falcon Heavy launch, which boasts double the payload capacity, is only about $150 million, not billion, million. This stark contrast highlights that while the space shuttle was a historic achievement, cost optimization was not its strength, especially when compared to the groundbreaking advancements SpaceX has made. So, how can this issue with the space shuttle be explained? To be honest, the only part of the space shuttle that wasn't reusable was its large orange fuel tank. Most other components were recovered and refurbished for reuse. Each orbiter underwent extensive refurbishment between missions. Technicians conducted thorough inspections and replaced critical components as needed. One of the most challenging aspects was the thermal protection system. Each individual heat shield tile was meticulously examined and replaced if necessary, as these tiles were essential for protecting the spacecraft during re-entry to Earth's atmosphere. The solid rocket boosters, or SRBs, posed another economic challenge. While they were designed to be reusable, the recovery and refurbishment process paradoxically turned out to be more expensive than just making new ones. After each launch, the SRBs parachuted into the ocean where they were retrieved, cleaned, inspected, and prepped for reuse. This process required extensive disassembly, testing, reassembly, incurring substantial labor and material costs. The reality contradicted the original version of significantly cutting launch costs, making the space shuttle program quite expensive. In contrast, SpaceX approached the problem differently with the Falcon 9 rockets, introducing the concept of vertical takeoff and landing for reusables. From the space shuttle, SpaceX learned that merely building a reusable was not enough. A launch vehicle also needed to be quickly reusable and also cost-efficient. The latest iteration of the Falcon 9 has minimized the need for extensive refurbishments. The average turnaround time for a booster has been reduced from 356 days to just 107 days, with the fastest turnaround currently at 72 days. The record now stands at a very impressive 21 days. SpaceX does not necessarily aim for ultra-fast turnaround times with Falcon 9, as it maintains a big fleet of boosters ready for launches across the country. However, SpaceX's ultimate goal is to achieve a refurb time of just 24 hours. To do this, they aim to match the rapid turnaround process of commercial airliners, with each rocket needing only a quick inspection between flights. During the short refurbishment period, the first stage of Falcon 9 undergoes a series of maintenance and inspection procedures to ensure nothing gets overlooked. Once the booster's back on Earth, either by road or sea, it's transported to SpaceX's hangar. SpaceX currently has several refurbishment hangars where Falcon 9 operations take place between launches. The landing legs are typically folded before getting placed on a transport vehicle. However, in the past, SpaceX faced many issues with the landing legs, often requiring manual removal. The landing legs are perhaps one of the most frequently refurb components as they experience significant impact when they land. After the booster is brought back to the hangar, the refurbishment process begins with each engine undergoing rigorous checks to ensure all components are flight ready. According to Elon, each Merlin engine can do up to a thousand flights without needing refurbishment. However, another benefit is the ability to examine an engine that's completed multiple flights and identify the parts that wear out the fastest. 
This is certainly one of the reasons why Falcon 9 is the most stable rocket in the world. The hydraulic grid fin system also needs to be checked for any leaks. Fuel tanks and pressurized vessels undergo a series of ultrasonic tests to detect small cracks that could lead to failures after the rocket's pressurized for flight. This is perhaps one of the biggest unknowns for every Falcon 9 rocket. With each mission, SpaceX gathers vast amounts of data on the pressure cycles that each tank can withstand. Once the booster passes the inspection process, it undergoes a static fire test with all nine engines before getting attached to the second stage and payload. Right now, all these checks still need to be completed as they enter the realm of multiple reusability. Each mission provides them with additional knowledge about the number of flights each booster can perform, and over time, the refurb process gets even more refined. And in the future, we can't help but look forward to SpaceX achieving even more milestones with Falcon 9. But is that the only thing SpaceX has accomplished? Of course not. SpaceX's continuously evolving rocket technology has enabled the company to develop a new recovery method with extremely high turnaround efficiency, catching rockets using a tower. Unlike the Falcon 9 landing system, SpaceX plans to use the chopstick arms on its launch tower to catch the Starship rocket. This innovative approach was demoed during the Starship Flight 5 launch in October, showcasing SpaceX's groundbreaking advancements in rocket recovery. For a booster or Starship catch, the rocket approaches the tower, enters the gap between the splayed arms, hovers in place, and then the arms close around it. It eventually comes to rest on hard points that appear to offer about as much surface area as a coffee table. As built and shown, they are closer to a tiny fixed landing platform capable of minor last-second positional adjustments. Eventually, the chopsticks could shave off a small amount of time off of post-recovery processing, removing the need for a crane or the same arms to attach to a landed booster or ship. With Falcon 9, SpaceX deploys three to four landing legs during the rocket's landing onto the drone ship. But here's where the issue arises. Perhaps one of the areas SpaceX has learned the most from their Falcon 9 landings is the landing legs. For Falcon 9 landings, the booster needs to be transported back to the refurbishment hangar, where many parts are replaced and checked. One of those crucial parts is their refurbishment process in the landing legs. All this takes a lot of time and is not an option for Super Heavy. Removing the landing legs entirely from the design not only simplifies the turnaround time, but also saves an incredible amount of weight. Every kilo saved allows the rocket to carry a heavier payload to orbit. With six legs on the Super Heavy, the overall mass of the landing apparatus will be about 10% of the whole booster and landing. Quite honestly, the rocket catching capability is extremely unique, but also quite complex and challenging, leading many space enthusiasts to wonder why SpaceX doesn't just make rockets in a simpler way. Why don't they let Starship take off and land like an airplane? In reality, a spacecraft like an airplane has disadvantages compared to a rocket. You're traveling for longer through the air, which means you have to deal with drag more. On a rocket, you spend very little time in the atmosphere because you're heading straight up rather than going up at an angle like a space plane does. It's better to get out of the densest part of the atmosphere than turn over and travel sideways after that. If you've got a jet engine or an air-breathing rocket on your space plane to make up for the fuel losses of drag, it costs a lot more than developing a rocket engine. Rocket engines are cheaper to manufacture because they don't have to be designed to intake air at subsonic, transonic, supersonic, and hypersonic speeds. Other than the distinction between vacuum and non-vacuum rocket engines only have to be designed for one environment, so they're simpler than an air-breathing space plane engine. Re-entry is harder in a plane. Re-entry vehicles have to travel through hypersonic, supersonic, transonic, and subsonic speeds, as well as deal with re-entry heating. Space planes have to be designed to withstand all that. The Space Shuttle Orbiter's design had to make several compromises because of this. They used large, heavy, and vulnerable delta wings to deal with the varying wing speeds. It had to have thousands of heat-resistant tiles that needed replacing every few flights, and it had to have a giant heavy fin to control yaw while traveling through the atmosphere. Falcon 9 first stage just slows down before re-entry, then free falls until the landing burns, avoiding pretty much all that. Planes' bodies are more complex than rockets. A plane is a complex shape designed to reduce drag and produce lift. A rocket is a glorified tube or propellant. You just roll a strong enough aluminum alloy into a tube and you got the rocket body, put in some propellant tanks and engines, and voila, you got a rocket. In short, each vehicle is designed for a specific environment. Planes are designed for flying, rockets are made to go to space. Try to make a perfect rocket fly through the air, and it will require so many compromises, it turns into a plane. 
try to make a plane for spaceflight, and it'll likely turn into an overly complex rocket. That's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Goodbye.